So let's get started. Um, welcome everyone to the 10th uh, UQM virtual seminar. Today we are very happy to have Shweda Wen, who is going to tell us about periodic, quasi-periodic, and random driving conformal field theories and the uh, Lyapunov uh, exponent. Um, Shweda, please go ahead. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Hassan. Yeah, first I hope everyone is doing good at home. <laughs> so uh, today, uh, yeah, I will introduce some uh, very simple story on some non-equilibrium uh, driving system. Uh, this work is uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, Rui Hua, Ying, Ying Fei, and Ashwin at Harvard. Okay, so first uh, let me tell uh, our motivation. The motivation is uh, very simple. We want to understand some very basic questions like what kind of uh, non-equilibrium physics can emerge when we drive a many-body system? And uh, are there any other parameters to characterize the possible phase diagram? And uh, how does the phase diagram depend on the type of driving? For example, you can do the periodic, uh, quasi-periodic, and the random driving. Uh, usually, uh, we can have different emergent phase with different kind of driving. Okay, we. As the initial uh, effort, we want to find some exact, exactly solvable setup to understand such questions. Uh, in particular, uh, we hope the result should be universal, which means uh, the result should be independent of the model uh, uh, we study. Okay, uh, the outline of this talk is as follows. First, I uh, introduce to you the, what, what is the setup. And then I introduce uh, uh, what is the operator evolution uh, with uh, driving. Okay, and uh, I will introduce what is Lyapunov exponent and how to use Lyap Lyapunov exponent to determine the fifth diagram and how uh, the different kind of driving uh, uh, result in different kind of fifth. I will gi also give some examples of uh, 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 periodic, quasi periodic, and uh, random driving. In particular, uh, there is a nice example uh, on the exact mapping between some quasi-periodic driving CFT and uh, uh, the, some quasi-crystal in solid physics. And uh, finally, I, I will give, give the conclusion. Okay, uh, let's start from the setup. As I mentioned, uh, we hope the, uh, our study is universal so we choose uh, the field theory, uh, which is the conformal field theory here. Uh, we know that conformal field theory uh, can be uh, considered as the effective field theory, uh, the low energy effective field theory of some interesting uh, gapless system, system like the critical icing, latent liquid, free Fermi, and so on. Okay, this, we use uh, CFT in one plus one D. Okay, second, how do we drive the system? Now, suppose we start from some initial state, psi zero. Uh, the driving here we use is discrete driving. What do I mean by discrete driving? At each step, at each step, we drive the system with a fixed Hamiltonian for some time interval t. Then in the second step, we, we can drive it with another Hamiltonian with another time interval t2. Okay, we can, we can repeat this pro procedure, so on and so on. So this procedure, I think, is very, very uh, universal. Uh, one thing I want to, uh, to comment is that uh, the initial state is not limited to the pure state. Our setup can be uh, applied to a mixed state, like the thermal ensemble. Okay, so the key part in this uh, setup is, is this. How do we choose the Hamiltonian? How do we choose the Hamiltonian? Uh, here, uh, we, we choose the Hamiltonian uh, at each driving uh, at each driving step uh, in, in the following form. First, we, we choose a CFT Hamiltonian, which, which has uniform Hamiltonian density. Now, we want to deform, we want to deform the Hamiltonian density with some function f, fx. Okay, so, so in short, uh, we, 
we can choose many different Hamiltonians. For each Hamiltonian, we can deform it in different way. Then we use these Hamiltonians to drive the CFT and see oh, what will happen. Okay, here the, the T0, zero is the nothing but the, the Hamiltonian density, which is the sum of the chiral part and the anti-chiral part. Okay, usually for, for, for a very general deformation, I mean, if you choose the f of x arbitrarily, then if, if we look at the Fourier components, if we look at the Fourier components of this Hamiltonian, we can find, oh, there are many Fourier components, which we call it Ln. Ln is, is a Fourier, Fourier um, uh, component of the, the, the chiral, the stress energy tensor T. And uh, similarly, we can define the, the anti-chiral part of the uh, Fourier components of the uh, stress energy tensor T bar. Okay. Now the question is this. If you choose the deformation fx arbitrarily, this question will be very challenging, will be very challenging. Because why this is challenging? Because the Fourier components ln, they satisfy, they, they satisfy some algebra, which is called Virasora algebra. So yeah, the, 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 the relation among the generators of ln uh, is this. This is the well-known Virasora algebra in CFT. This algebra is infinite dimensional. This is why it's hard to, to, to study <laughs> because it's infinite dimensional. If you use this generator to drive the system, I don't know how to calculate it uh, uh, exactly. So our trick, our trick here is no, we will not consider a general deformation. We will simply, we will simply focus on a very simple case in the following sense. First, we know that there is a sub-algebra of this Virasora algebra, which is called SL2R algebra, which means if you choose M and N in this way, M equals minus N, you can find, oh, this algebra is closed. It is also finite dimensional. Uh, because uh, what I mean by closed is this algebra is only generated by three generators, L0, L plus N, and minus N. This algebra is finite dimensional. Good. So then you may ask, oh, what kind of a deformation of the Hamiltonian corresponding to this uh, sub-algebra? Uh, the answer is this. If we deform the Hamiltonian density with such kind of function fx, you can find that there is a constant, there is a cosine term, there is a sine term with arbitrary coefficient. OK. this is. If we deform the Hamiltonian in this way, so the only algebra involved in this problem is the SL2R algebra. And then we can handle this question by hand. OK. I think now the, 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 uh, the setup is clear. We simply deform the Hamiltonian with some simple function. So only a finite algebra is involved. We can solve this problem by hand. For arbitrary kind of driving. So why this kind of deformation is simple? The reason is very, uh, the, very the, the reason is uh, as follows. If we deform the Hamiltonian with this SL2R algebra, you can find in the Heisenberg picture, if we study how the operator O evolve under the, the Hamiltonian, under the unitary evolution, you can find, oh, the operator O uh, Z, Z bar is evolved to operator O Z nu, Z nu bar. There is a simple relation between Z nu and uh, Z. The, the, the relation is, is simply a Mobius transformation. This is simply called the uh, Mobius transformation. OK, now you have, you have I think you, you are more clear why I choose this kind of deformation? Because under this deformation, the operator evolves in a very simple way. Only uh, as Mobius transformation is, is involved. Now, let's go, uh, go one more step further. If we drive the system with a theory, with, with a sequence of Hamiltonians, what will happen? 
and this operator will, will, will simply evolve from z, z bar to some uh, position zn and zn bar. So zn is related with the original position z through a, 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 match, a product of SL2 matrix. This is the product of SL2 matrix, right? This means, oh, when you drive the operator for arbitrary long sequence, finally the position of the operator is simply related with the ori original value through a product of matrix. So what, what is this? Now I want to remind you of what we learned in solid physics, okay? Um, uh, before I mention what, uh, what happened in solid physics, let, let's uh, make one more comment. Uh, this, this SL2 matrix here has the general form uh, um, uh, uh, here. So each uh, matrix element it can be some complex number. So this matrix is SL2C matrix. More precisely, it is SU1, comma 1. This matrix is isomorphic to SL2R. Yeah, this is some, simply some uh, uh, mathematical uh, effects. Now let, let, let me remind you uh, what, 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 what kind of similar things we, we, we see in the solid physics. In solid physics, when we studied a tight bending model, we, we use the transfer matrix. Transfer matrix, uh, here, the psi n is a, the amplitude, is a wave function for the electron on the site n. And the vn here is some on-site chemical potential. And uh, when we solve this uh, uh, Hamiltonian, or we solve this Schrodinger equation, we simply do the transfer matrix. So what is the transfer matrix? Suppose we know the, the wave function at site uh, one and two, then we can obtain the wave function at site n and n minus one through this relation. Okay, we define uh, the capital psi n as a wave function on the site n and n minus one. Then we have this relation here, uh, the product of matrix from T1 to Tn is simply the product of the transfer matrix here. Here Vn is the potential, E is the possible energy, is the, is the, is the energy. So this matrix is SL2R, okay? Till now, I think the, I simply want to make an analogy. In our solid physics, when we study the, uh, the wave function in a lattice, we use the transfer matrix, uh, which is a product of some SL2R matrix. And here, when we study the CFT, the time-dependent driving CFT, we also consider a product, we also consider a product of matrix which, which is SU1, comma 1. You can see the structure is very similar, right? Actually, although the concrete form of the matrix look quite different, we will see many similar properties between the two different models. Okay, good. Now let me mention some correspondence first before, before we study the, the, the concrete, concrete model, okay? So, once we usually, once we see the product of matrix, we can define the Lyapunov exponent in the following way. Now we, 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 uh, we multiply n matrix. Then we take the log of the, the matrix product. Here is the, the norm. Usually for the norm of the matrix, you can choose, you can use different definitions, but here different definitions is not essential here. Okay, the Lyapunov exponent is defined by one over n log of this matrix product taking norm here. And then we take n go to infinity. Okay, usually you, you, you will ask, oh, how, uh, why this Lyapunov exponent is useful? Okay, why it's useful? Usually, if, if you see a positive, positive Lyapunov exponent, it means the transfer matrix the norm can will grow exponentially large, which means you will see a localized state. You will see a localized state in the lattice. On the CFT side, I will show you if the Lyapunov exponent is positive, we will have a heating phase. 
which means the system will absorb energy on and on. On the other hand, if the Lyapunov exponent is zero, it means the wave function can be extended or critical. Here, what, 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 what do I mean by the crit critical wave function? Critical wave function means the wave function is neither extended nor localized. For example, it can be power law decay. This is a typical kind of uh, wave function, which I call critical wave function. Later, we will say, if in the lattice, we, we, if we see the extended wave function, it means in the CFT side, we will see some heating phase, which means when you drive the system, the system will not absorb energy. And uh, at the phase transition, the the, the energy, the, the system will absorb energy, but in a very slow way. This is what I mean by phase transition in the CFT side. Yeah, actually here I, is uh, the behavior of the energy growth in the three possible emergent phase, which I will introduce uh, in the following slide. Okay, so uh, besides the energy growth, we can also use the entanglement entropy to measure which phase are we in? We can find that in total, there will be three kinds of behavior for the entanglement growth, which is linear growth, oscillating, and log, log, log growth. Okay, this is, this till now is simply some very general co correspondence. I will show you example now. Okay, we will study different types of driving from easy to difficult, we will introduce the result according to the following order, periodic, random, and quasi-periodic. So the periodic driving is very simple because the driving sequence, will, we, can, we, will repeat, we will repeat the driving sequence with some period. So essentially, we simply need to focus, focus all our attention in a unit cell, in a unit cell. If we understand the property of the, 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 the matrix product in, within one unit cell, we can understand what happened after n unit cells. It turns out there is a very simple way to determine the possible phase, the possible emergent phase in this case. What we simply need to do is we simply need to, to check the product of the matrix from M1 to MP Within, within one unit cell. The only quantity we need to check is the trace, is the trace of this matrix product. If the absolute value of this trace, we call the product as uh, pi p. If the absolute value of this trace, pi p, is bigger than two, we will have a positive Lyapunov exponent. The, the CFT will be in the heating phase. If this quantity is smaller than two, we will have some non-heating phase. The system will not absorb energy. If this value equals two, it means it is the, the CFT will be at some phase transition. How to understand this result? Now let me remind you what happened in transfer matrix. When we study transfer matrix in lattice model, if the trace of this pi p uh, is the absolute value is smaller than two, it means the energy E is in the energy spectrum and the wave function is extended. If you choose some other energy E, so the, the, the trace of, so this quantity is bigger than two, it means E, the energy is not in the, is not in the spectrum, but in the gap. And in this case, the wave function will be localized. Okay, there, there is some, in intuition in the lattice system. Now I, I will give you an example on the minimal, minimal setup of periodical driving CFT. We simply drive the system with two different Hamiltonians that we call H1 and H0. So we, we drive the system with H1 for time interval T1 and drive it with time, uh, drive with Hamiltonian H0 for time T0. Okay, the Hamiltonian deformation H1, we simply choose it, uh, for example, uh, with this form. Okay, there are the parameter 
a theta. When we tune theta, it can have a different deformation. Okay, now if we drive the CFT with these two different Hamiltonians, if we, we use the criterion uh, here, we have found that we can determine the phase diagram. Here, I, I simply choose a different kind of deformation. We can have, we can have some rich phase diagram. The blue region is a non-heating phase, and the red region is a heating phase. So if we look at the entanglement entropy, for example, of the half system, the entanglement entropy of the half system, we will find, oh, in this blue region, uh, the entanglement entropy simply oscillate as a function of time. In this red region, which is the heating phase, the entanglement entropy will grow linearly in time. At the boundary between the red region and the blue region, the entanglement entropy will grow like log t, log t behavior. Okay, this is how we, we, we can use the entanglement entropy to, to, to char characterize the different kind of phase in a dry, uh, time dependent periodical driving CFT. Okay, later we found, oh, there is some very interesting fine structure uh, within, the phase, within each phase of the phase diagram. What we found is follows, as follows. If the CFT is in the heating phase, in the heating phase, oh, we found that the, the, the CFT will absorb, the system will absorb energy exponentially in time. But then the question is this, if the, if the energy is uniformly distribute, distributed in the system or not, Oh, what's amazing is that we found that the energy density, they are in the, this is the real space. Uh, the y-axis is uh, energy density. We what we found is, oh, there are two energy peaks within the, within the heating phase. What's more interesting, one, one peak, one peak is chiral. The other peak is anti-chiral. What I mean is, so suppose we stop driving the system then y peak, this peak will move rightward, and this, this peak will move left. We have, two, we, have, we have one chiral peak and one anti chiral peak. What's more interesting is that the total, the, the, the total, the entanglement entropy in the system is mainly contributed by the entanglement between the two peaks, which means, as I mentioned, in the heating phase, the entanglement entropy here will grow the linearly in time. All the contribution of this entanglement entropy here is contributed by the two peaks, one chiral and the other is anti-chiral. This is quite amazing because I think if we, if we, we can study the ADS-CFT duality, what is the possible structure in the, in the gravity do? It is possible we have some wormhole connect connecting the two, the two peaks in the real space. But we, we don't know, yeah. So what I want to say is that in the heating phase of the uh, driving CFT, there are, some, there are many interesting structures in the, in the energy density distribution. Okay, till now this is the minimal setup of the per period, periodic driving CFT. Next, I will go to the random, random driving, random driving CFT. For random driving CFT, so what happened, uh, we, we want to find some analogy in lattice, right? The first thing that come, come in, comes into our mind is the Anderson localization, right? I think all, we, all of us know the Anderson localization. It simply means in the tight bending model for the on-site chemical potential Vn, if V is randomly chosen, if there is some randomness in the potential V, then we can find, oh, for arbitrary energy E, when we solve the transfer matrix, we can find that the, the, the wave function is localized. This is the Anderson localization. So actually, there is a mathematical uh, theorem which can prove Anderson localization, which is called Furstenberg theorem. First, Furstenberg theorem, theorem is very powerful. It, it simply tells us in the, the following thing. 
suppose we have S, suppose we choose some random matrix, which is SLNR. Yeah, note here is SLNR, but not SL2R. So SL2R matrix is the transfer matrix in Anderson localization, which is simply a, a specific case in Furstenberg's theorem. So Furstenberg theorem is more powerful because we can study arbitrary n here. If we choose arbitrarily um, random matrix in SLNR and we multiply them together, so Furstenberg theorem tells us under what kind of conditions the Lyapunov, uh, the Lyapunov exponent is always positive. So Furstenberg found that if we, if we can satisfy the following two conditions, the, the, then the product of the random matrix must have positive Lyapunov exponent. So what two conditions are these? One is non-compact and the other is strongly irreducible. Let me explain what's this. Suppose we choose the random matrix and uh, suppose G, G mu, G mu is the smallest subgroup which, con which contains the random matrix you choose. So this, this, this smallest subgroup must be non-compact. This is condition one. And the second, we should have for arbitrary subgroup of this G mu, for each subgroup, it should be irreducible. This means strongly irreducible. Suppose we satisfy the two conditions, then first Merger theorem uh, tells us the product of this matrix, the random matrix must have a positive Lyapunov exponent. So for Anderson localization, we can easily check. For Anderson localization, both conditions are satisfied. This is why there is always local, localized phase, but no extended phase. This, this is how to use the Furstenberg theorem to prove Anderson localization. But now we want to use the Furstenberg theorem in a random driving CFT. In the random driving CFT, we also have a product of two by two matrix, but this matrix is not SL2R, CR, SL2C. How, how do we use the Furstenberg theorem? We simply need to embed SL2, SL2C into SL4R because we can always embed a SLDC matrix in, in the SL2DR matrix. Then we can use the Furstenberg theorem. Okay, before I introduce, uh, before, before I move, move on, you may guess in the random CFT, maybe there is only one phase which corresponds to Anderson localization, right? Yeah, I, uh, we, always, we, we, we also believe so, but it turns out this is not the truth. Let, let me tell you why. Okay, uh, to study the random driving CFT, we need to study the product of many SU1, comma 1 matrix, which is a sub, sub, subgroup of, of SL2C. Okay. Yeah, naively when, when we do the when we do this calculation, we, we, we try different kind of randomness. We find oh the CFT is always in the heating phase. But later when we check some mathematical mathematical theorem, which is called the Simon theorem. So Barry Simon in 2005, he he proved that for for a random product of SU1, comma 1 matrix. In, uh, so when the Furstenberg condition, I mentioned two conditions, compact, uh, non-compact and uh, strongly irreducible, in, in, in which cases the two, the two conditions are satisfied and in, which condi in, in what case the two conditions are not satisfied. He simply exhaust, so, so Barry Simon, he simply exhaust all, all the cases that the Furstenberg theorem is not satisfied. There are, only four different cases. I will not go through one by one. I will simply tell, what I simply want to tell is that when we go through the four different cases, we find, oh, when our uh, random driving CFT, uh, when we choose the, the Hamiltonian H0 and H1 in, in some specific case, the Furstenberg theorem does not satisfy, which means there is no, the Anderson localization, we cannot naively 
consider there is always localization in the random driving CFT. There are some excep exceptional points where the random driving CFT will not be heated up. Let me tell you what is this point. Okay. Yeah, first I want to tell that if we choose the uh, drive the uh, CFT with two random Hamiltonian, if you choose the two Hamiltonian randomly, if you study the entanglement entropy, the entanglement entropy will always grow the linearly in time. We will always grow the linearly. But there is one single point, which we call it exceptional point. When you, dri when you drive the system, drive the CFT randomly, the, the, the system will never absorb energy. Which mean, and uh, in the, in, if we look at the entanglement entropy at this exceptional point, the entanglement entropy will simply oscillate all the way. So what are these, what, what is this exceptional point? Okay, let me introduce this point uh, as follows. Suppose we choose two Hamiltonian HA and HB with simply this deformation. We have uh, some theta parameter within this deformation. Now we, we drive the two, the CFT with Hamiltonian HA and HB, but in a random way, okay? Which means with probability uh, one half and one half, for example. So if we drive the, uh, if we drive the system with the Hamiltonian HA with some time interval TA, and we drive uh, the, with the Hamiltonian HB for some time interval TB, if TA and TB is chosen in some, at some specific value here, then the, this is the ex except, exceptional point we, will, we, 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 we found. Okay, what's the meaning of the, uh, TA star and the TB star here? So when we deform the Hamiltonian, so each, each Hamiltonian will, uh, will have an effective length because because when you deform the Hamiltonian, some, if you uh, put a quasi particle in the system, the quasi particle will move uh, faster in some uh, location and uh, slower in some other uh, place. So we can define an effective uh, length of the CFT. So when the time uh, interval TA and TB are chosen as half, half of the effective length of the system, okay, then this is the exceptional point. Okay, uh, let, let me give a short, a very short summary here. So what I want to say is that if you random, randomly drive the CFT with, with probability one, the system will be heated up. But there is some exceptional point, which we found from some mathematical theorem. And at some exceptional point, the system will not be heated up. What's more interesting is this. Suppose at the exception, exceptional point, if we drive the system not randomly, but periodically, we will find that the system is in the heating phase. Is in the heating phase. So, so, so this, is the, this is the amazing thing. If you drive the system randomly, it's not heated. But if you drive it periodically, it is heated. More interestingly, later I will show you if we drive the, at the exceptional point quasi-periodically, it is in the phase, it is at the phase transition. So this except, exceptional point is very interesting because when we drive it uh, in different way, we can say heating, non-heating, and the phase transition. Okay. Okay, I will give a short summary till now. Just now I've simply mentioned the periodical driving CFT and uh, the random driving CFT. In the periodical driving CFT, in general, we will have heating phase, non-heating phase, and the phase transition. In the random driving CFT, we, in general, we only have a heating phase, but there is some exceptional point in the non-heating phase. It is only a single point, so the, the system will, uh, at this, exceptional point, the system will not be heated up. Yeah, so this, till now this is the periodical driving and the random driving CFT. If there is any question, 
Uh, you can ask uh, now. I have a question. Um, yeah. So do you see these hotspots also in random uh, drives? Like when you have, oh, yes, when you're yes. in the heating phase? Yeah, I, I didn't mention some detail. No matter in random driving or periodical driving or the quasi periodical driving I will introduce later, suppose that we are in the heating phase, we will always observe two energy peaks, two energy peaks in the real space. This is a common feature. But so I thought this is a stroboscopic uh, measurement, right? Yes, you are right. So how do you define a stroboscopic measurement uh, for the random drive? I thought your period, there's no period anymore. Oh, good, uh, yeah. yeah this is, in random driving, in general, I, you will always see the, 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 the two peaks, two energy density peaks. But uh, in random driving, in general, the position of the two peaks will move can move in the, in, the, in the system. They are not fixed. In the periodical driving, the, the two energy peaks will, will not move. They are, they are always fixed when, when you observe the system as, in the integer time of driving. So does this uh, answer, answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. So any other, other question? Okay. Now, uh, just now, I, I simply mentioned to you that what happened in a periodical driving and a random driving CFT. Next, I want to tell what happened for the quasi-periodical driving. Okay. For quasi-periodical driving, there are many interesting models. The most beautiful one, in my opinion, is a Fibonacci, Fibonacci quasi-crystal in 1D. So what is this model? Again, we have this tight binding model, but Potential V, potential V is not periodical, and it's also not uh, random. But the potential has some sequence like A B A A B. Some sequence here. You may ask, oh, why this sequence of uh, A B A A B is called uh, quasi periodic? So the reason is how to generate this sequence of onsite uh, chemical potential. The way to generate it is use a rational rotation, which, which simply means, okay, we, we rotate the, uh, some function with the frequency omega, and the time is the integer n. n is actually the, the site, the number of the site n. So when you, then you rotate, you rotate the, 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 the variable. If the variable in, in region A, we will, we will choose the, the potential at VA. If the, Variable is in region B, we will choose the potential at VB. This is the way we, we, we define some quasi, uh, uh, some Fibonacci sequence. We simply use some irrational, irrational uh, rotation. Suppose we choose, actually here, this frequency omega is the uh, inverse of the golden ratio. This is why it's called Fibonacci, Fibonacci sequence. If you choose this omega, as some rational number, we will always get a periodic, periodic sequence. There, there are different ways of uh, generating this Fibonacci sequence, but this one, this irrational rotation is the most intuitive, intuitive way. So I, I will, there are some other methods I will not uh, introduce. Then you will ask, oh, how do people study the property of this Fibonacci quasi crystal? Okay. In the early paper of this uh, area, people cannot study this Fibonacci quasi crystal strictly, but people can study the Fibonacci quasi crystal by using the by using the periodical one to, to approaching to approaching the Fibonacci limit. What do I mean? Now, as I mentioned, the frequency omega is a inverse of the golden, golden ratio. Now, if we choose omega as fn minus one here, fn minus one over fn, fn is the Fibonacci number. If n goes to infinity, we will approach the Fibonacci limit. For finite n, we will always get some rational, rational number omega and the, 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 the crystal is not a quasi crystal, but a crystal. Then we can, we can, 
people simply take take n from smaller number to the larger and the larger number and look at how how the energy spectrum of the quartz crystal evolve as, as we increase the number n. What people find is, is very interesting. As we approach the Fibonacci limit, we can find that there are more and more energy bands. Yeah, we will have, finally, we will have infinite energy band. But the band, the bandwidth of each energy, the band, bandwidth of the, in the energy spectrum will become the smaller and the smaller. So this is how people study the Fibonacci quasi crystal in practice. Then mathematically, it was proved that for arbitrary, VA does not equal, equal VB. VA, VB is uh, the, potential, the potential sequence we choose in the Fibonacci quasi crystal. For arbitrary choice of a potential, the spectrum is a counter set of zero measure. What's more interesting, in the spectrum, the wave function is polynomially bounded, which simply means in the spectrum of the Fibonacci quasi crystal, the wave function is power law decay, but not localized and not uh, ex extended. Then we will ask what happens for a quasi periodical driving CFT. Okay, before any mathematical study, let's, let's simply uh, check uh, use, use, using the, let, let's simply use the same logic in the uh, quasi crystal. We use some rational number to approach the Fibonacci number and see what happens in the fifth diagram of this driving CFT. What we simply observe is that as we approach the Fibonacci limit from left to right, okay, for some small, smaller uh, Fibonacci number, which, is, which means the system, we are driving the system periodically, we can find, oh, there, there are both heating phase and non-heating phase. So the region in yellow is the heating phase. The region in blue is the non-heating phase. Now, as we approach the Fibonacci limit, we choose the, uh, the omega, which is f n minus one over f n, increase n on and on. We, we, what we observe is that, oh, the non-heating phase will disappear. Finally, in, for example, in this plot, you will say, oh, Almost all the region are, are in the heating phase, the, the yellow, the yellow region. Okay. Here I didn't show some some fine structure in this in this heating phase. Actually, if you plot the you can define the Lyapunov exponent in this heating phase, you will see many interesting self-similar structure in the Lyapunov exponents, which I, I didn't show here. Okay, uh, in this in this in this plot, I simply choose some specific Hamiltonian HA and HB. If I simply uh, change the Hamiltonian HA and HB, we will get uh, some other different phase diagram. Yeah, we are here from left to right, we are doing the same thing as before, but we change the, the Hamiltonian HA and HB in some other form. What I want to say is that the feature is robust. So what, what feature is robust? As we approach the Fibonacci limit, we will always say, oh, the heating phase is dominated. Actually, we, we find that the non-heating phase will always disappear. Then we will ask the following question. In the Fibonacci limit, can we prove that the non-heating phase is a counter set of measure zero? What is the feature of the entanglement and energy evolution in the, in the non-heating phase? I mean, Although, if you, if, if you simply look at the fifth diagram through your eyes, oh, there's, finally, you will find in the Fibonacci limit, there's no non-heating phase. But the answer is there is, but the probability is zero. I want to emphasize that probability zero doesn't mean impossible. <laughs> there is, but the possibility is zero. Probability is zero. All right. <clears throat> so, to to because okay, because in the Fibonacci quasi crystal there are many 
there are thousands of papers uh, in mathematics which prove some which prove strictly the spectrum property and the wave function property of the quasi crystal. So now we simply think if we can map if we can map our phase diagram in the CFT to the quasi crystal, then we can use every mathematical result in literature, right? This is our strategy. Actually, we find indeed we can make an exact mapping between the phase diagram of the Fibonacci driving CFT and the energy spectrum in the quasi crystal. The mapping here is a little bit technical, but let me uh, sketch the main procedure of this mapping. So in the, in, the in the Fibonacci quasi crystal, when we consider the product of the transfer matrix, we can define M, M tilde Fn as the product of the matrix. So the number of the matrix is the Fibonacci number from M1 to Mfn. So what's amazing, so the beautiful property in this uh, Fibonacci sequence is that uh, this M tilde satisfy some very nice property here. There are some nice property of the, the matrix in, in this Fibonacci uh, sequence. So if we can define the trace of the, the, the half of the trace of the matrix, we can find there is some recursion relation between the trace. Here, we call it the equation of motion. This equation of motion satisfies some um, there is some constant of motion in this in this Fibonacci sequence, which relate to the the trace of different metrics. This is called a constant of motion, which relate to the trace of uh, the x. This is the uh, x f n x f n minus one, x f n minus two. So the three variables uh, live on this manifold, this two D manifold. So depending on the sign of this environment i, if i is positive, we will have this kind of manifold. If i equals zero, so the there is a touching touching point here. If the environment is negative, uh, this this part in the middle is uh, decoupled with the other parts. So so in the Fibonacci sequence, the problem is reduced to study the how a point uh, evolve on this manifold, how a point evolve on the manifold. So this point means the trace, the trace of the matrix. Because I swear that, uh, uh, yes. sorry to interrupt, your time is uh, almost over. So you <laughs> want to wrap up. Okay, fine, fine, fine. Yeah. So uh, yeah, this is too technical. I, I will simply show you the result. Uh, because, because the nice property of the Fibonacci sequence we can study we can study the trace of the matrix, but not the concrete form of the matrix. Finally, we can we can find an exact mapping between the phase diagram. Here in the in the in the bottom is the phase diagram of the uh, of the Fibonacci driving sequence, and uh, in the top is the energy spectrum of uh, the crystal. As we approach the, the Fibonacci limit, we can find that there is an exact exact mapping between the two. Oh yeah, okay. I actually have more to say, but I, I may not have enough time. Uh, I will skip skip them. Uh, in this slide and the next one, I simply want to say the in the Fibonacci driving CFT in the non-heating phase, the the entanglement entropy will grow a lot log as the log of time and the energy will grow the power power law in time. This is similar to the behavior of the wave function in the Fibonacci quasi crystal. Yeah, one more comment. Uh, actually, we, we, we study um, a different kind of uh, quasi periodical driving. Uh, we also study something called Aubrey energy uh, quasi periodical driving. Here is some uh, phase diagram. I don't have time time to show. Sorry. Okay. I think I till now we have found some partial answer to our motivation at the very beginning. That is, what kind of non-equilibrium physics can emerge in the time-dependent driving many-body system? 
we have heating phase, non-heating phase, and the phase transition. What are the order parameters? We, use, we can use a Lyapunov exponent. We can use entanglement entropy evolution. We can use energy evolution. And how does the phase diagram depend on the type of driving? Yeah, how, we, we have shown some different examples, right? And uh, as a summary, as a summary, in the periodical driving, we have a heating phase, non-heating phase, and the phase transition. In the random driving, we, we, we have a heating phase, but with some exceptional, exceptional points in the non-heating phase. For the Fibonacci driving, we have a heating phase and a measure zero uh, uh, critical, critical phase. For more general quasi-period driving, we can have heating phase, non-heating phase, and the critical, which I didn't have time to, to tell. And uh, in all the three cases, as long as the system is in the heating phase, the, the entanglement entropy of the half system entanglement entropy always grows uh, uh, linearly proportional to the Lyapunov exponent. And the energy, total energy grows uh, exponentially with the rate, uh, the heating rate is uh, the Lyapunov exponent. In the future, it is uh, interesting to generalize the SL2R algebra to the Virasora algebra. It is also interesting to add the non-integrable terms uh, in the driving. Yeah, sorry, I, I, it seems that I, I prepared too, too many materials and cannot <laughs> tell uh, the detail, some details. Yeah, if you have a question, we can, we, can, we can chat later, yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you so much, Rueda, for sharing your interesting results with us. Um, so now we have time for some questions, maybe very quick questions. Maybe I, I, I present, I, I tell the story too, yeah, very quickly. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Actually, so I have a question. Yeah. Um, so you have, uh, so, you, so you make, made some general statements about, uh, about these phases, and then you showed us one, one sort of, yeah, example using these, the one quasi-periodic example. Yeah, um, yeah. So what, I think you said somewhere along the lines, uh, something along the lines of this being, uh, uh, these results being general in some way. What, what indication is there for that? Good, so what, what, what do I mean by general? As long as we drive the CFT, use the SL2 algebra. Mm. As long as you drive the system with SL2 algebra, all my conclusions here are, uh, are true. <laughs> okay, I see, so this was just one, so you've already worked out the general case, this was just to illustrate it. Uh, SL2, yeah, SL2R, suppose mm. this, you know, the very interesting future question is, in CFT, the, the, the the very basic uh, algebra is the Virasora algebra. Mm. So SL2R is the unique, is the, is the only sub-algebra of Virasora algebra, which is simple here. The mm. next step we can, I mean, there's no other sub-algebra -sub in Virasora algebra. If we, if we want to move one step further, you need to go to the Virasora algebra. That will be more interesting, I believe. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I have also a quick comment about what you said. Yeah. Um, I mean, because I'm also <laughs> kind of working on this problem, kind of following you. Yeah, good. Um, yeah. I think, I feel like there is some notion of rigidity here. Like even if you deform your SL2R a little bit, all these things are, all these claims are valid, I think. Oh, I mean, okay. yeah. Okay, it doesn't have to be liter exactly maybe SL2R. I, I don't know, I feel like, if you even like add more Fourier components, like uh, I don't know, maybe let's say you have L plus one minus one and L zero, and then you add I don't know L two and L three, but the coefficients are small enough, right? Uh, then so that you're not kind of moving too far, it's like a, I don't know some attractive fixed point, uh, whatever. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Has some rigidity to some extent, I feel like. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how to prove this. Uh strictly, but uh, you know, 
in a physical way, usually if you add some perturbation, uh, yeah, it, it is totally possible that the feature, if you don't take a very long, very long time, I mean, if you in some finite time, maybe the heating and non heating structure is, uh, uh, is always there, but uh, if you add the perturbation, but it takes some much longer time, maybe it will destroy some property here. Um, Right. Yeah, for me, because I, I, in my opinion, if we add another gen Verisora generator, L, L plus minus N, L plus minus M, uh -huh. we need to go to the Verisora algebra. This, if I want to solve this prob problem exactly, this is, will, will be very, very challenging, very, very challenging. Yeah, maybe nice. we can make some approximation, some good <laughs> approximation. Yeah, which I don't know. Yeah, maybe we can discuss on this later. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So if there is no other question, um, let's thank the speaker again and uh, thank you everyone for you know joining us today. And uh, we'll have our next meeting in two weeks. So stay safe, everyone, and have a good day. <laughs>